Are you satisfied with your understanding of sustainability? If you are not, imagine a journey together, a pluralistic one, with academia, innovators, startups, NGOs, all looking for solutions to the greatest challenge of our time. My name is Samuel Etini, and this is the Sustainability Journey. Welcome to a new episode. Today, we are going to meet a change maker, somebody who has been a successful entrepreneur working in sustainability. And also, I mean, I've learned from his name, had a predestination of being a sustainability leader. So I'm really proud to and to welcome to the sustainability journey, Moritz Grun. I hope I pronounced it correctly in my who are Dutch. Thank you so much for being here. You have been at the forefront of sustainability for many years and working really to foster change in our plan, in our businesses. But before that, we want to ask our guest, our usual question, who is Moritz? What is your sustainability journey? Which are the key milestones in your journey towards in sustainability field? The journey started a long time ago, actually, since I was seven, eight years old. At the neighborhood where we are living in the southern part of the Netherlands, uh, all of a sudden a forest got cut in order to build a new quarter of homes. And I thought that was a kind of battlefield. I really was shocked by the, the sight of all these felled trees that had to make place, had to make way for, uh, for ho- houses. And by that time, I just uh, had learned to read and write in a newspaper that I was an avid reader. Uh, I learned that newspapers are made from Paper, of course, and papers made from wood. And at that time, we hardly did recycle anything, let alone also paper. So I thought to help save trees by collecting waste paper in order for it to be recycled. And from that on, I learned that you could also recycle clothes and whatever. So at at a young age, I started to collect all kinds of so-called waste. As we know, is raw materials in the wrong place, in the wrong combination, at a very young, early age, because I didn't understand the system, I started to work on what is now called circularity, because we how nature works. So I thought, why, why is this crazy thing of just taking, breaking, making, and wasting, why is this normal? So I just couldn't understand that. So, of course, uh, later on, I, I started to study political science, it was also in order to learn about the world because I didn't understand it. And when I started to understand a little bit about it, I thought, this is not normal. We should be building a new normal. And I've been trying to do that in in different capacities. Fantastic. Wow. And that is, uh, you can see from early age now, your work and your journey has been a transformational one. And we will discuss about some of your work and some of your remarkable achievement. One of them, one of the notable projects, uh, it is the Waka Waka Foundation, which was about, was about solar solution, especially to underdeserved community. Why you have focused on that and what, which are the impacts and how you have developed that work? Well, actually, as you know, still with 8 billion people in the world, there is almost a quarter that is not connected to the power grid. So people for light, and especially in the, in the Southern Hemisphere, there's hardly any dusk. The, the night falls within half an hour. Many people have to rely on kerosene, which is a toxic fluid effect that they have to set fire to in order to have at least a little bit of light. Very dangerous, both for their health, for the environment, but also for fires. So a lot of, especially children, die every every day. Hundreds of children die in fires. And many more even get maimed for life because they have the scars of severe burns when kerosene light topples over. Whereas also these people are living in an environment where there's a lot, in Africa, for example, there's a lot of sunlight and you can transform that light into power. So together with Companion, I founded Waka Waka, which is Swahili for shine bright, uh, which is a very small f- mobile phone size and mobile phone weight solar light that can also charge mobile phones and also car- can charge the fan for an efficient cooking stove, which I also later on founded a foundation that will help people that now have to cut trees in order to, f- to cook their meal that they can do so in in a much more efficient way, not using wood, not using charcoal, but pellets made, compressed from 
agricultural waste. So you solve a waste problem. You don't have to cut any more trees anymore. And people don't have to spoil their health by cooking on, on fires. That's very inefficient. Inefficient fires, very polluting fires, also pollute people's lungs. So that's a kind of way you, that you can solve many problems at the same time. Fantastic. It's, it's really important. I can... I understand because being here and having work also on those part, I can see you, I, I feel also when going to the community, the need for that and the, and the transformation and a stove and a solar light can bring into rural community that's with kerosene and the smoke from the, the open fire. It's really, it's really important. And some other ventures that you have done because you have been really very prolific and you are still prolific entrepreneur are a very innovative project like Kipster and All Greens. Can you explain a bit about those two, those ventures, the Kipster and All Greens? How do you embed sustainability in, in their operations? Well, as you, as I just uh, said, many sectors of, of uh, the economy, in my, in uh, my opinion, are very anormal, illogical, destructive, etc. So what I try to do by setting up companies is showing not only telling and preaching, but showing things can be done differently. And not only better, because better often is a little bit less bad, but really rethink the whole sector or the whole product or the whole factory, for example, producing of food, producing of energy, logistics, whatever. But just think it, try to really think, think it through what kind of function you want to perform, and then think how this would be when we would do it in a good way, not in a better way. Again, there's often less bad, but in a good way. And then try to arrange things like that, that you can really perform it and show it as an example of what can be done already. And that, that I've done with energy, solar energy, with, with food, for example, with Kipser or Holy Greens and a number of others more. Fantastic. And how they work, this company? For example, the Holy Greens or Kipser, what is, what is the, the transformation you want to bring? Take Kipster. The, the Dutch word for chicken is kip and the Dutch word for ster is star. So a star is ster. So Kipster, it's also a funny word, Kipster, hipster. So it makes people laugh, maybe, or a little little uh, smile on their face. But it also has a meaning, a star of a chicken. Myself, I'm a vegetarian. We should eat, especially in the affluent West, much less meat, because too much meat is not healthy for our own health. But it's certainly not healthy for the environment. For example, in the Netherlands, we import that much food, for the animals that we grow and that we have that we have for meat, which is the size of four and a half times the, the total size of the Netherlands, so we have that many animals that we that we need a lot of space elsewhere to grow the food for the animals. And as we know, producing food through through raising animals is very inefficient. The cow uses eight times as much. And food, then it in the end brings. With a pig, it's four times. And with chicken and eggs, it's, it's a very efficient way of doing so because it has a conversion rate of about one to one. But then again, the chicken industry is what is normal, so-called normal, is quite unhealthy. It's not nice for the animals, but it's not nice for the environment either. So we try to rethink the whole industry. So we only feed the chicken the so-called leftovers from society. Humankind wastes one third of all food that being produced. In, in the Southern Hemisphere, that's mainly because of the fact that there's not good storage so that food goes to waste or there's no good logistics. The food doesn't reach the market. And in the affluent West, the Western world, we often waste it because we just throw it away out of negligence in some way or another. But one third is being wasted. And we want to reduce that amount of waste because it's ridiculous, because production of that, of all that food requires a lot of money, space, energy, 
all kinds of inputs. So we should reduce our waste considerably. And what's still left as waste that we cannot or will not eat, we sh- we must use that as food for the chicken or the or the pigs that we then can eat. So then the, then we have a circular system. But that by saying so, we also have to take care that the animals are being held in a situation where they can perform their natural needs. So to say, I mean, we shouldn't keep them as prisoners in a in a prison so to say so if we as humans want to eat these animals at least the least that we can do is give them a good life as long as they live so that's what we want that's what we want to do with kipster any people that that are watching this could look it up it's called kipster k i p s t i r dot com dot dot farm kipster dot farm and the same holds true for holy greens Holy with double H, W H O L Y, and then greens, of course, and dot com. That's a pasta, Italian pasta, but not made from wheat, but with a cereal spelt. Half of it is spelt, and the other half is greens, vegetables. But moreover, it is greens that otherwise would be thrown away. Not because of the bad quality but because it doesn't fit the size of the supermarket tray, for example, or there's a little spot on it, or it's a bit bit, uh, bended, or has not the the conf, I mean, the the so-called perfect size or looks or whatever. So that's being thrown away at best use as animal fodder, but often goes to landfill or to make biogas out of it. It's perfect food for humans still to eat, so we transform that into a food that people want to eat. And that is so important. And we will put all the links in the description of the portal so you can learn more and understand also these this sustainable businesses. And you are not stopping there. We know you have done a lot of work and you are also helping companies to work on sustainability policies, communication strategies. So which are the challenges that you as an helper, a facilitator on this, you you witness in organization when they want to implement and become sustainable. Well, often, as all these companies have to work within a framework that is uh, inherently, systemically not beneficial to sustainable practices, you often bump into, you run into the boundaries of that system. So in the end, because every company has to has to maintain itself to survive in a market that is that is protecting companies that have been developing over the last decades within a framework that is inherently not sustainable. Otherwise, we wouldn't have the mess that we see around us. It also shows where the system has to change. And sometimes what I try to do is by setting up together with other people, uh, these companies of which I was just mentioning a few of them, is to find the cracks in the system or to find the people in in the CEO position, for example, in influential positions that want to go along quite some way into changing the system. Often there is some maneuvering space within the system that you can use to show things can be done differently. And then, of course, laws, regulations have to change in order to not be detrimental to the companies that want to do better. Because often that's the case. The people that that want to innovate, the people that want to invest in more sustainable practices, they stick their neck out, but they run into the limitations of the present situation, the present system that has evolved over years. Instead of, I said it, building a lot of hindrances for for those companies, we should help them to at least have a level playing field so that governments are are not hindering, but helping companies that actually want to to realize, to, to execute the goals that governments have set. Because governments can all only have set rules and try to force them but they don't build roads themselves. They don't build products themselves. They they don't grow food themselves. So it's companies that do that, and they should therefore help companies that that want to do better than the present system is able to perform. 
and it's very interesting. And uh, uh, subsequent to that, since even you have met and done many businesses, you have also helped company, wh which is something that Moritz is really proud of. Can you give us a success story or a case that makes you proud? Well, proud. I'm, I'm, I'm really glad that I'm in a position to be able to contribute a little bit in, in that respect. And I'm very happy that we've been able to help a few million people to save solar sustainable light with Waka Waka. And that we have been also able to, to help people with these efficient cook stoves. That we have been able to set up a company that is actually producing the first circular solar panels in the world. It's a, it's a company in, in the Netherlands. It's called Solarge. It only consists of sand and plant. The sand to produce the, the, the PV layer and the encapsulation can be produced from plants. It's, it's a polymer that is UV resistant. It can resist the ultraviolet variation for, for 25 years. And then again, you can completely 100% recycle all the material, unlike the present solar panels that are being produced that have glass with antimony and aluminium and a PFAS, the, etern the eternally toxic material that protects the back sheet of, of solar panels, through which the fact is that all the solar panels that are actually being produced in 20, 25 years will be chemical waste that we do not know what to do with. And that's an enormous pile. Because at the moment, the production of solar panels in itself, that's a very good thing, of course, is such that we can cover the world around it, which is 40,000 kilometers, with a width of 100 meter every year. So when we produce that quantity of solar power, that's a good thing. But if we, in the end, end up with a huge amount, an enormous amount of chemical waste that we don't know what to do with, that's a bad thing. So I'm, I'm very proud to be part of a company that is producing the first circular and ultra lightweight solar panels in the world. Fantastic. And we'll discuss about that maybe because it's really, it's really an innovation that can be a game changer, especially in the transition. Maybe you know the, the, the book uh, Draw Down by Paul Hawken, which has been written on the basis of the research by thousands of scientific people around the world. And they were asked by Paul Hawken, the head editor of the, of the book, what are the solutions that are presently available? So not innovation in the future, but presently available that can help solve the climate crisis. And they came up with a list of the top 100 solutions. There are many more, but the top 100 of, of presently available and accessible and affordable solutions. Draw down. Brilliant book. There's also a website that you can look it up and also look into the basis of the research. And the, the number one solution is a better way of cooling rooms, products, etc. A better way of cooling. Cooling so recently with well, was done with CFKs, fluoride gas with chlor chlorine in it, which destroyed the ozone layer. So when we learned that, as humanity, we made a bold move and we re removed the CFKs from cooling, which is a good thing. And now after 35 years, the ozone layer starts to re recover, which is a very good thing. But then again, we replaced those CFKs, which HFKs, still the fluoride was in it. It was not harming the ozone layer, but it's a disaster for the climate. The global warming potential of these new cooling agents are sometimes 10,000 times as bad as CO2. And, and when you take into consideration that 1.7 billion air conditioners are around on the planet and the climate gets hotter and we get more wealthy. So the International Energy Agency is predicting that within 25 years time, we will have tripled the number of air conditioners. So that will be three times 1.7 billion, which is a disaster because they require a lot of power. At the moment already, 10% of all power being produced globally goes to cooling. So just imagine that we triple that. Often that power is generated by burning fossil fuels. So it, it, it's a, it's a vicious cir circle. I'm part of a company. It's called Dutch Climate Systems. 
that after 18 years of research has been able to produce an air, con an air conditioner. By the way, it's also a, vent a ventilation machine with heat recovery, but also air, co air conditioning with water as a cooling agent. And it reduces the number, the, the amount of electricity be being necessary to cool by 80%. So you, you only have 20% of the present needed, presently needed power supply in order to, to, to reach the same goal. So, and, and again, like with the solar panel, also this product is 100% recyclable. It's an innovation that's really a huge leap in the development of the product that, that can deliver the same service, but without all the harm that is now being done by the devices the equipment that we now are being producing on a global scale in enormous numbers. These are these are companies. I'm, I'm, it's not my achievement. I mean, I can boast about it, but I'm really very happy that I can at least contribute to those companies, bring them onto the market, bring them under the attention of of legislation, bring them onto the attention of media and 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 consumers, etc., because they can really make a difference. And it's really important, and I really like that. So also in the sustainability agenda, we bring voice to change makers, people that with technology there, they, they are showing that solutions are there, and then we just need to scale them and work and, and transform also the way we, we, we use our technology and, and work. And I think in on that, in how to change the narrative and showing that change is possible, innovation is possible, your work in the communication part has been instrumental and 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 really also you got prize you have produced directed radio television documentaries so how the media and which role of the media as an expert can play an important role in promoting sustainability i think that's very self-evident because if people do not know that alternatives exist they won't be able to take the right decisions either as an as an investor, or as a consumer, or as a voter, or as a politician, first, the first thing is that you need to know that it exists, it can motivate people, and it can help them promote these, the use and, and the production of these well, better devices. And then I want to ask how you have used that in a, your work, so to advance sustainability goes the power of communication. I've been writing some books, radio and television documentaries, in order to put people's attention to the fact that uh, there's not only doom and gloom, because normally news is bad news. Good news is not interesting, because it's not spectacular often. At least it's not drama. Of course, pr the prevention of drama is the good news that we want to bring to people, but it's often not appealing to journalists. So you have to really think of clever ways in order to to bring this good news to the public. And of course, it's a, a challenge to do that. But the harder the challenge is, the more interesting it is to be able to achieve that goal. And it's really important. This also we are trying with our means of the progress to try to spread news in a way and possibilities and voice. And looking ahead, I want to ask this question since you have working, you're still working in this wonderful innovation we've discussed. Which are your predictions also for the future of sustainability, especially in this great divide and polarized position that we, 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 we witness every day on the media, on the political side? Which are also the contribution of people on how to be, to instead of divide, to bring together and reach finally this objective? There was an American writer by the name of Buckminster Fuller who said, that the best way of fighting a system that you want to get rid of is not fighting it, but coming up with a better better solution and showing people the perspective, the better alternative, and to take them along and to make them enthusiastic, win them as supporters. Again, the best way of fighting the old system is coming up with, with a better one. And it's really, it's really a good one. Sometimes it's, you know, to fix something that is broken is very difficult. So we need something completely new. And talking about that, now we are going towards the end of the episode. And really, I want to ask from this, if you have to distill your knowledge and your experience of so of uh, entrepreneur, which are the lessons that you have learned in driving sustainable change and driving social entrepreneurship? 
that you can share with our audience as an advice for somebody that wants to walk the same path as Moritz? I want to be modest here, but what I've learned for myself is, like I said, when you want to make a change in the system, try to to look where where your own capacities and where your own passion is. Try to apply that to a sector or a product where where your heart lies, and then stick to that and never give up. For example, with with the Kipster, it was impossible as a political scientist to sell dozens of millions of eggs to the biggest supermarket chain in the in the whole of the European Union without even having one single chicken. It was very hard. We had an idea. We didn't have the money. We didn't have a barn. We didn't have anything. We just had the idea of a new system that should be there. It took several years before we succeeded in convincing the CEO of this uh, supermarket chain that he believed in giving us a, the opportunity to prove that we could do it. And when he signed the contract, where he only would have to pay for the eggs after we had delivered them in a good quality, of course, so in the end, the risk for him was not that big, but it was a systemic change because we had we had signed a contract with him for a number of years to 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 sell to him all the eggs for a guaranteed decent price and these are four conditions that are normally never met in any contract with farmers with big supermarket chains because they want to look for good products at the lowest price at the nicest conditions for them and not so they they are a buyer they are not a partner so you have to look for people that and I call them the cracks in the system, that want to partner with you because sustainability is about partnership in the long term. It's not about fighting for, for the biggest piece of the cake, but trying to, to give everyone that, that much that they need to have a sustainable business. And that is as well for the, for the, in this case, for the farmer, as well as for the supermarket, and that you, you stand with each other, whatever the circumstances are, because a supermarket chain wants to keep on selling eggs and a farmer wants to keep on selling the eggs to the supermarket, want to produce them. And they both want to be able to do that. So if you, if you have a partnership and it's not to maximize your profits, but to guarantee a sustainable business, look for people that can be a, that can be an ally in in this respect, and then act like an ally yourself as well, and then keep on doing that in a sincere way. And I believe very much in sincerity. People feel when you are sincere. On on the basis of that, I think I think you can you can find allies, and together you can make miracles happen. Fantastic. No, thank you so much. And it's really, it's really an important lesson and to bring together this allyship and working together towards a common goal, which is not often the case. Uh, in, the, in the business as normal, everybody is trying to tighten from their side and then the, 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 there is no a common goods perspective. So I really want to thank you so much, Moritz, for this uh, wonderful episode. It's been a pleasure and honor having you at the, the journey. My pleasure. Thank you very much. Are you satisfied after this wonderful episode? Let's continue together our sustainability journey.